I'm Harrison, old fogey grandpa. <laughs> I'm here to bring you a message on this series that we started last week on Colossians, a good start. And uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Colossians. It's a letter Paul wrote to this church in the valley church in Colossae, and he talks about this church, which we looked at last time, with kind of some pretty glowing words to, to show that this church that wasn't decades old, this church was years old, but, but this church is off to a good start. He says, they always give thanks because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, and that's what we looked at last week, that they've got, this church has something good going on, they've got a faith that's sound, and they've got a love for all God's people. And so, you know, that's something that is kind of special that a church should be after, and not every church has that. But then he, he goes on to say that the faith and love that spring from the hopes that stored up in heaven, about which we have heard already, the true message of the gospel that has come to you. And then he says that this isn't a unique church in the sense that they've got this good start. The, the good starts are happening all over the place. There's a pattern of good starts. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. That something dynamic was going on, not just in that one congregation, like, wow, there's their standout. No, this was happening all over the place. Why are we here, millennia later, across the ocean, you know, gathered in this way, looking at this same gospel? It's because the gospel has been off to good starts over and over again. There's this common pattern. If you've been driving through Iowa, you will notice that the fields, they are dormant. I mean, they are dead. Everywhere you look, fields are dead. And in almost a miraculous way, in just a few months, wherever you look, you will see fields all throughout Iowa that are growing and bearing fruit. It's just going to be happening, and it's going to be a pattern of happening. And it's not going to happen, you know, by God just saying, let it be. It's not going to happen because some central bureaucracy is going to, you know, make sure it happens. No, it's going to happen because all throughout Iowa, there are people, I was talking to one on the phone just this week, that they're already thinking about their fields. And they're thinking about the time that's going to be required, what needs to be lined up. You know, people have already got some of their seed lined up and they've been, you know, working on their inputs, what they have to do, because they know that they've got to plant those fields. There are people, they've taken a responsibility for their fields, that they're going to get them started and they're going to see them through. And, and that's the pattern that, that's going to bear fruit throughout all these fields in the same way. In the same way, Paul says, that, you know, that, that's how the gospel works. People have to hear it, and, and they have to hear it and understand the grace of God fully. And the way that happens is somebody has to have a burden, a, a passion. Somebody has to take the responsibility to bring the message. There has to be a, a starter. Every good start comes from a good starter. And we're going to look at Epaphras today because he was the good starter for this church in Colossae. And uh, Epaphras, he's probably not somebody you've had a lot of Sunday school lessons taught on e Epaphras. In Colossians, he gets four verses. We're looking at chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, and then chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. That, that's all we hear about Epaphras in Colossians. And then we get another little snippet from him in a letter that was probably sent at the same time from the same place to Philemon. An individual letter, and it says, yeah, that uh, Epaphras is here with me, you know, my fellow bondservant. So we're looking at this 
good starter because good starts come from good starters. Basketball is wrapping up and uh, already I heard some people talking about track. Track is going to be going on. And I tell you, I have been to more track meets in, in Iowa than I ever would have dreamed in my life I, I would be in. I ran track in high school in South Dakota two years. Um, and I think in my two years, there were probably two times that I was in the fast heat. But, you know, I wasn't like, track is my life. I'm going to be going to track meets all the time. But now it's like, oh, track is my life. I go to track meets all, all the time. And, and so I've watched a lot of track meets. I've seen a lot of races. And, and you want a race to get off to a good start. And, and every race that starts is started by a starter. There's always a starter at a track meet. And, you know, th these starters, they're not just doing whatever they want. They have authority to, you know, make things happen, but they exercise that authority underneath the accountability of others. They've got to know the rules. They've got to know all the rules of track, what can happen, what can happen, and they, they've got to be able to bring those to bear. They, they work for the, the people that hired them to do the track meet. They also work for the runners. They're kind of concerned about the runners, that everybody gets a fair shake, you know, nobody gets out in front. They're concerned about the safety of the runners. You know, if somebody gets trampled down in the 1500, the first 100 meters, then we'll shoot the gun and, you know, we'll see if they can still run. We'll peel them off the track and let everybody else run. But the, the, the good starters, like, always have to start good starts. And Epaphras is that good starter for this church that's off to a good start. And uh, he comes from Colossae. If you want to bring up the, the map, we don't know exactly, like we've got to read between the lines a little bit because we've only got these few verses to work on, but the theory of like how, how did he come to start this church in Colossae? If you look at the blow up there of that little region of Asia, it's kind of brought up there. The, the distance from Ephesus on the far left side of it, right in the uh, inlet there of the water, the coastal city, to Colossae, this Lycus River Valley city, is 100 miles. It's 100 miles there. And, and so what they think is most likely is that Paul, he, he had come through on the second missionary uh, trip, he'd walked through uh, to uh, Ephesus and he had uh, started preaching there to people and he found a hearing he, you know, started in the synagogue, moved out of the synagogue, went next door. I'm sure that didn't go over very well. When you get kicked out of the synagogue, you go next door and you start expanding this. But it was a very open city for the gospel. And so lots of people heard. He was there two years, which is a very long time for Saul. But if you think about it, two years. Two years is a very short time for somebody to be formed spiritually. And the, the thought is that Epaphras, that he was a part of these meetings in Ephesus, that, that he grew in his faith by what Paul was doing in Ephesus, and, and that he took it from Ephesus, and, and he went 100 miles back to his hometown city, Colossae, and he said, man, these people, they, they've got to know this. They've got to hear these things. And, and so he shared there in Colossae and established this church. He was the good starter for this church that was off to this good start. And, and not only did he work there, but in verses 12 and 13, especially 13, we find out that he also did work in Laodicea and Heropolis, which some would argue were even more um, significant cities in this area. So he's going all down the valley, starting the work. He's the good starter that this good start came from. And uh, we want to look at his life today, just from these snippets we have. This is like a pretty short reference but it's a good reference. 7, 8 in chapter 1, 12 and 13 in chapter 4. And I've got 10 characteristics in your uh, outline there. Could be 7, right? But 10, just such a nice list. So we'll, we'll make it work. Number 1, works hard with and for people. It, it, a characteristic of a good start is somebody that works hard with and for people. I should say something before we go too far in this too. Um, why should you listen to these 10 characteristics? So that you can identify a good starter when you see one? No. 
so that you can pray that there might be more good starters? Yeah, but that's not the main reason. Why you should pay attention to these 10 characteristics is because God needs more good starters. And you can be one. You can be a good starter. And, and what it takes is a, a willingness to do God's will and, and a kind of a, and a just intentionality, like, hey, I want to become this kind of person. So that's why you want to write these down. Works hard within poor people. We find in verse um, chapter 4 that he's a hard worker. And Paul's writing to his home church and just commending him. Verse 13, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. So he's a hard worker and he's introduced, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. So not only is he a fellow servant, which not a lot of people got recognized by Paul as a fellow servant, like he's working with them, but he's a dear fellow servant. Like this is a person that knows how to work with other people. Sometimes you think entrepreneur, starters, like they're independent, you know. They, 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 like, they just do their own thing. Nobody talks to them. I, I, I do what I want. But that's not the mindset that we're given here in, in Epaphras. He's somebody that's a fellow servant, and, and he's a dear one. He cares about other people. And then he works with them. He's working with Paul. And he's working for the, the people of Colossae. He's not domineering over them but he's working for them because he's a servant. Sometimes we think, man, man, people that start stuff, they're like this bowl people over. No, that's not the way. He's he's serving. Number two, works hard on behalf of people. Who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. So he's accountable. Accountable. There's a real shortage of accountability. Sometimes I think people are trying to work themselves out of accountability. Sometimes that's why they want to go start something. Like, I'm going to go be my own boss. I'm going to go start this because then I won't have to be uh, accountable to anybody. But that wasn't the mindset of Epaphras. He wasn't like, okay, you got Ephesus, Paul, but stay away from the Lycus Valley because I got Colossae and I'm taking Herapolis and Laodicea with me. You know, I've got all this and nobody tells me what to do. No, he, he's like working on behalf of Paul. He's subordinate to Paul and he's bringing reports. Nobody likes bringing reports, but he's bringing reports to Paul. If you're going to be a good starter, you got to be accountable. You got to be accountable to other people. I, I like our church that, that we're a, a congregationally ruled church, that, that everybody's accountable to everybody else in, in that regard. And, and I'm not against elder-led churches. I think those can work as long as the elders realize, like, hey, you're still accountable to this congregation. You know, they can walk away. You've you got to have this sense of, of accountability. Serves Jesus' agenda. Okay, so three, four, and five, I'm taking them all out of one thing, actually, and six, so this is four for one here, but who is a faithful minister of Christ, faithful minister of Christ, so number three, serves Jesus' agenda, a faithful minister of Christ is after what Jesus wants done, not after his own agenda, like, oh, I just want to, you know, get my own church, get this thing figured out, and then, you know, then we'll, after we do this, we'll do, do this next thing, no, like, what's Jesus' agenda? Because I'm, I'm a minister of Jesus Christ. i got to be ministering his agenda. We have ministers going around all over right now. Like, Russia, it seems to me, they are going into Ukraine. Like, I, I would be shocked if, if that does not happen. It just seems like everything's lining up, and you can't hear um, any more news about it than, than we're hearing and, and so these ministers from Western countries, like they're, they're going and offering diplomacy and trying to get, get things to work out. And they have to be very careful, you know, they got to work it out with Ukraine, whatever they say, and work it out with um, the other Western nations, whatever they say. But, but imagine a, a minister, you know, like an ambassador of the United States going in at to, to uh, a meeting with Putin or one of his subordinates and saying, hey, I don't really like Ukraine. Go ahead. 
take them, you know, and, and I'll work with you. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a cut and I'll say, yeah, I'll give you some pretext to get in there and, and attack them. It's like, well, if that gets out, that person will no longer be a minister. Like they, they won't be an ambassador because you got to serve the agenda of the one you're ministering for. Share Jesus' truth is number four. Faithful ministers, they speak the truth of the gospel. And, and so if you're going to be a minister, a faithful minister of Jesus Christ, you got to stay to the true message. There's a lot of different messages floating around out there that, that people are propagating to make their own way in the history of the church. Yeah, that's happening. And what seemed like it was going on in Colossians, that people were bringing these false messages, like, hey, this is my message, and then I'm going to gain my following. That's not what we're called to do. And how are we going to stay to the Jesus' truth? And number five, you got to study God's word. So a faithful, you know, a good starter studies God's word. You have to be biblically sound. You, you got to know these things. What is the true message? And then number six, exemplifies Jesus' faith and character. A faithful minister is authentic. You're the real deal. You're not faking people out. You're not putting on a show. You're developing the character that, that exemplifies Jesus to others. So you're working on humility. You're working on courage. You're working on patience. You're working on kindness. You're working on love and gentleness. You're working on all of these things. You're learning the Bible, and you're learning how to live with other people so you can be a dear fellow servant. And then seven, this is uh, from chapter four. And this was the, I think, one of the most challenging ones for me. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. He is always wrestling in prayer. So number seven is always wrestles in prayer for others. And I was trying to think, like, man, do I wrestle in prayer? Like, I, I never wrestled in high school. I wrestled just a little bit in college in intramurals, uh, right? And wrestling is, who are our wrestlers out here? Who have, who's wrestling or has wrestled? Raise your hands. Okay. So no, not, see, it's, it's not a huge sport, is it? But um, when, when you do it, don't you think, like, just a few minutes can feel like a half hour or an hour it is, it is exhausting. And the, the only way that I've figured out to make it less exhausting is, is to lay on your back. <laughs> you, you, you do not have to suffer like this, people. Like you, can be, you can be out of this in, in a hurry. You know? it's like, then you got to swallow some pride and you know, walk out, and you might not get to wrestle that much anymore. But, um, but it, it happens. It's, it's hard work. And so when somebody describes wrestling in prayer for people, I think, wow, what does it look like to wrestle in prayer for somebody? I think that there's a couple times in my life when I think, yeah, I think that, that would be, that I wrestled in prayer for others. I think I really wrestled in prayer for this situation or wrestled in prayer for that situation. But he says he always wrestles in prayer for others. And, and that's associated with where he talks about hard work. So I, I wondered when he said that, Epaphras is a hard worker for the kingdom. I wondered if he was saying like his hard work is, you know, all the other things he's doing besides prayer, or if the hard work that, that he was doing was he's taking the time while he's visiting Paul in prison and he's praying, praying, praying for all these people, not just for the Colossian church, but for the um, Laodicean church and the Heropolis church. That's something to work on, I think, for all of us. The evangelism team, like, they have that as a goal, that we would be praying for the people that we want to reach. You know, that we'd be praying for them. I think, wow, what it would be like if we were all wrestling in prayer for even just one person? And what difference might that make? Eight, addresses problems. Uh, a, a good starter addresses problems. Because if you're going to start some work of faith, 
whatever it might be. Sunday school class, small group, church, plant, whatever it might be that, that you might start. If there's people involved, there's going to be problems. Like, th this church was off to a good start, but they had problems. That's why Epaphras is talking to Paul. That's why Paul is writing this letter. That was a part of the report. Hey, there's, there's some people that came in and they're teaching some stuff that doesn't seem quite right, and I'm not sure how to deal with them. Can you give me some guidance? Can you give me some top cover? You know, give me some message to bring to these people? Because there's, there's problems. And we don't know where Paul was in prison when this letter was written, but throughout most of church history, as, as they've studied it, there's like three possible places. One is Caesarea uh, on the coast of uh, Israel, where Paul, we know Paul did some time in prison there. Paul did a lot of time in prison. Uh, Paul was a good starter, too. Just a warning, you know, you want to be a good starter, um, know how to go to prison. Uh, so th that's not likely, though. It's like, it doesn't make any sense that, that Paul would even be able to see somebody in, in uh, Caesarea. So that, that's probably not it. Um, if Ephesus, Paul probably did some time in jail in, in Ephesus, and they don't think that's it. Paul did a lot of time in jail in Rome, we know, and he was able to see people and receive people. And, and so the most likely bet is that Epaphras came not a hundred miles from Colossae to Ephesus, but, but that he made a sea journey like this is a huge time investment. He, he went all the way from Colossae to Rome to address this problem. It, it seems like it would be easy to say, well, let's just let this go. Or like, you could take that group, I'll take this group, you know. No, but he, he addresses the problem. And, and we cannot ignore problems, we've got to address problems. If we're going to be good starters. Problems in our own life, boy, they need to be addressed. Problems in our families, Hey, we've we got to address some problems in our congregation, problems in our culture. We've got to be a people that realizes, hey, there are problems, and, and how do we address them? And look for wisdom on how to do that. And then number nine, a vision for maturing disciples. What's he wrestling for, these people in prayer all the time? Not that they'll be free of cancer, although that is a great thing, but... Uh, being free of cancer might actually be counter to what he is praying for. What he is wrestling in prayer for is that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. That you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. Uh, he's got a vision for maturing disciples. That, hey, I, I want all of these people to be standing firm, Mature, fully assured. It, look around you. There's another service of, of people that were here before you. What would it be like if, if all of us, if all of us were mature in Christ? And, and if we were fully assured and we were standing firm on the will of God, like that would be one powerful church. And, and that's what he's got a vision for. But he doesn't just have a vision for that. He has a vision for that, and we should too. We do as a church we haven't realized it i don't know that we ever will but we got a vision for it but he has a vision for an expanding kingdom so he hasn't just prayed for that to happen with the church that he planted in his hometown but he's working hard for you and for those at laodicea and Heropolis. so he's going down the valley he, and, he, and he's connecting with, you know, Paul in, in Rome. He's got a vision for the kingdom advancement. There are times when we're like, oh, I want to be mature, but in, I, what can I do, you know, to help others until I get mature? I got to get mature myself before I can help anybody else. Um, some of you may be parents. Some of you may be thinking about becoming parents someday. You know, some people, when they're thinking about this issue of, you know, should I be a parent, shouldn't I be a parent, they're like, you know, I don't know if I'm mature enough to be a parent, but, you know, when I get fully mature, then I'll be a parent. Like, no, you won't be. And, and if you think you are, when you have kids, you will realize, as you're raising them, that you are not. Like, whoa, that's a little more impatience than I thought I had. 
boy, that's a trigger anger that I didn't know I was, I was there with, you know? And like, wow, I have no idea how to resolve th- th- this issue. Like, I, I need help. And church is, is the same way. You cannot wait till like your family gets fully matured before you're going to get engaged in helping other people get started in the faith. You, you can't wait for your congregation to get fully mature before you're going to get started in helping other congregations to get started and helping other congregations to get going and mature. Because you cannot be fully mature in Christ if you're not thinking about others, if you're not getting others going. That is the way we mature. He takes these people that are rough fishermen and he brings them on the way and, and, and he works with them and he puts them in the work of advancing the kingdom. And they are growing as they're going. So you got to have those 10 characteristics. That's all. In two years, what would it be like for you if two years from today, this list was true in your life? If it's not already, because we have some good starters here, because some good things have been started. And nothing good gets started if good starters don't do it. But th- there's a, a shortage of good starters. And, and that's a problem. When uh, I was in high school, brace yourself, Vince, wherever you are. I don't see you. Um, this was in the early 80s <laughs> when I was in high school. And uh, we had study hall. And we had these magazines bound in plastic. You know, that was back when they had magazines. <laughs> and uh, the popular mechanics, I pulled that off and I was looking at it and they had this article on the Ford Taurus. Revolutionary engineering in this Ford Taurus that made it aerodynamic, like they just really shocked people with the way they shaped this car. And they worked the underbody so that this thing was so aerodynamic that it would get you know, great mileage and just go like, wow, that was my dream car. The Ford Taurus, you know? So fast forward to the late 90s, and I've just graduated from seminary, and I got hired by a church. Like, wow, this is amazing, you know? Living the dream, I'm associate pastor, and, and I buy a Ford Taurus, deep burgundy, you know, burgundy interior, very used, <laughs> probably one of those early 80s <laughs> versions, but you know, no, it wasn't that old, but it's like, this is my dream car. I'm driving my dream car, doing my dream job, and I'm going to ground round to meet with somebody to make the kingdom happen. And so we're having our meal at ground round. I don't remember what we're talking about. But I remember leaving ground round. You're like, yeah, get into my dream car. You know. <laughs> Nothing. It wasn't like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It was like. And, and it just all of a sudden, it was like, what in the world? It was like, no starter. And a dream cannot go anywhere without a good starter. It it just is not going to happen. And there's a shortage of of good starters. And so we've got these church goals that we've laid out, congregational goals and uh, exciting goals. But man, we we need good starters to have them happen. You know, add another contemporary worship service on Sunday morning. There's uh, not everybody excited about this, okay? Truth be told, we got a survey going out. Uh, To all of you, you can kind of give us your opinions. But why would we do that? Why would we add another service on Sunday morning? There is not a shortage of churches for people who want to go to church. There is not. Like, there's, there's not even a shortage of places to go in, in this church. Like, if you want to go to the first service, there's plenty of seats there. If, if you want to go to that service... But there is a shortage of churches people want to go to. I think this church has gone a long ways to try to become a church that people want to go to. And and part of what makes that happen, and we're not where we need to be yet, but you you know, the work that you've done to make the facilities welcoming, that, that's important work. The work that, that was done to, to make the basement nice for kids, that the kids are excited to go down there. and they're, they're, that, that, that is a big investment. That Some churches just are not willing to make that investment. And, and that's huge. But beyond the facilities, 
is welcoming people in as they come in. And part of welcoming people is giving them space. And so we want to give people space for this temporary service. And, and this may not work, like this might not be the solution. I'm not saying that, but we're trying to be a, a church that's meeting a need, that there's, there's a need for churches that people want to go to. And, and we want to be that. We got a goal to uh, offer, celebrate recovery. And, and we've never offered this before, but man, there's a need in our area. We've heard it talked about. There, there's a need in our congregation. Like, we're struggling. I mean, it's hard to become the kind of people that we're called to become. There, there's issues that, that take us down, and, and we need help in this. But this program, it'll never get off the ground without a good starter. And we had good starters that started the children's church and good starters started Awana and good starters are starting small groups and we need more small group leaders so we need good starters for that. We need some good starters to step up and say, yeah, hey, we'll get this going because people need this and they want to go to the kind of things that they need. Then there's a goal to uh, plant a church. Identify a church planter and a church location to plant a church. And again, like, hey, there's no shortage of churches for people that really want to go to church. They can find a place. I think there's a shortage of churches that people want to go to, but I think there's a crisis, a serious shortage of churches that want to go to people. It's like, you don't have to come here. I'm coming to you. In your mess, in your life, and I'm bringing acceptance. I'm bringing love. I'm bringing hope. I'm bringing truth, and, and, and I'm taking it to you. And, and church plants do that better than other churches. Why? Because they have to. Like, there's nobody that wants to go to their church. They got nothing to offer. They're just getting started. And so they've got to go to people. And you don't have to be a church planter for that to have that kind of mentality. We've got a goal that we'd have 30 go parties. And uh, some people are opposed to this goal. Not a lot. But I'm just, I would like to talk to you. If you're opposed to this goal, I'd like to know, why are you opposed to this goal? Like, is it that it's a party? Like, okay, you know, you don't have to serve alcohol. But... Uh, 30. We want to have 30. And, and we have 100 plus households in, in our church. Like 100 plus households could be doing this. Probably we all should be doing this all, all the time. Why would we set a congregational goal, you know, to have 30 households host this kind of party where we're getting believers and non-believers together? Be, because it's a good start. There, there's just such a shortage. And the challenge that we have is that we desperately need good starters to get the good start thing going, but, but good starters are always coming from good starters. So if you could bring up our pathway. If you look at those characteristics of Epaphras' life, the accountability and the, the service, his knowledge of the word, his exemplifying Jesus, his you know, taking it out to others, it, it, it really fits in with what we're trying to do here with every person. You know, you got to be connected with Jesus, connected with his church. So here somewhere, you got to get connected. That's accountability. That's, uh, that's working with others. And then you got to grow more like Jesus in faith and character. You got to know your scriptures. You got to change, you know, who you are as a person. You got to serve Jesus and others if, if you're going to be a good starter. And, and then you got to go talk to people uh, about this, show them Jesus' love. And, and we all have to do this. And, and in two years, <laughs> I can't wait to see what God's going to do. And it all depends on us now, making a good start on being good starters.